who is from Hong Kong, Studio 2 Pilates in Hong Kong, and he is here doing another webinar. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, Emily. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me again. All right, so we have something special that we're doing this year for our webinars. And what we have is we have some flash quizzes or little pop quizzes that we sprinkled in throughout the webinar. And what you can do is win free education. So tonight we have free education from Leaders in Fitness, which is an online education company, leadersinfitness.com. And they have donated three, uh, three programs or educational programs for the winners of the, um, the pop quizzes tonight. So those will be sprinkled in. They're all about today's webinar. So get those keyboards ready because it will be to the first person who can answer these pop quizzes correct. Again, there will be three pop quizzes sponsored by Leaders in Fitness. Get ready. So without further ado, again, we have Kevin Moore from Studio 2 Pilates in Hong Kong. He is going to be speaking about psoas sequencing and pelvic stabilization. Welcome, Kevin. The floor is yours. Thanks, Emily. Um, all right, folks. So as Emily mentioned, this is my second time presenting for the EBFA. And uh, the first time, uh, I was talking about glute function. And for those of you who were able to join me for that, uh, I'll be touching on a few of those points here and there. Um, if you weren't here, just know that it's going to have a lot to do with antagonists. We're talking a lot about eccentric control and antagonists in an effort to get good uh, um, psoas activation. Also, for those who weren't here last time, to tell you a little bit about me. I, I um, Originally, my background is in Pilates. Most of my, my certifications are in Pilates. But uh, I also do uh, a lot of Chinese martial arts and uh, a variety of other movement methods, Franklin Method, Alexander Technique, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, uh, I, I try to look at movement through as many lenses as possible. And so today what I'll be presenting is not so much a, a system of exercise or a way of exercising, but a way to view the relationships of you know, these particular tissues so that whatever method you use, if you're a yoga instructor, if you're a massage therapist, if you're a surgeon, you know, whatever, uh, you'll be able to apply some of these relationship ideas to your method. So uh, uh, when I did the glute presentation, uh, it was almost immediately that someone brought up, hey, I, I, I'd love to hear some stuff about the psoas. And, and I know it's because no matter what kind of method you use or what field you're in specifically, we see psoas dysfunction popping up all the time. And uh, you'll see in a little bit, I have a pretty clear theory as to why I think that is. But to first get at dysfunction, let's talk about function. All right, so you can see here, we're looking at psoas major and iliacus. Uh, uh, psoas minor uh, is conspicuously absent, and, and only because um, in about 40% of individuals, psoas minor isn't present at all. And the research that I have been able to dig up hasn't really showed that much of a difference between individuals that have a psoas minor and individuals that don't. So I've decided to go ahead and call it essentially irrelevant for, for the purposes of this talk. We'll be mostly going over the function of psoas major, but of course, iliacus is going to factor in as well. Um, uh, take a look at our origins and insertions. Origins are in red, insertions in blue, obviously. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have a notepad with you, taking some of that down, not only will help you maybe uh, uh, get a prize from the quizzes, but also I'm going to refer back to these points a little bit later. Um, you know, the, the, the group, the iliopsoas group, has become kind of what, what I like to call a demonized muscle. You know, we, we uh, especially in the fitness industry, we spend so much time talking about how to stretch it and how to release it. But I think the idea of what it's supposed to do when it's functioning properly has gotten kind of pulled away from us a little bit. Uh, so we're going to try to take it and in, in, in highlight its functions a little more clearly. So after we've noted origins insertions, let's move on to the next slide and see what we can find out about its synergists and antagonists. And this, you know, this right here, this information right here is comp comprises a lot of my method, understanding what muscles act along with it and what muscles antagonize it. So obviously, you know, on the antagonist side, we've got glute max. Glute max is the most powerful antagonist in the psoas. And it's also one of my favorite muscles. Uh, so as you're taking a look here, again, if you have a notepad with you or uh, uh, just kind of take, make a note of these, because again, they're gonna come up later. Um, 
tightness in a muscle is a little bit different than the idea of over recruitment. And I think that most frequently we see in a psoas is over recruitment. And to to fix the uh, to fix an over recruiting muscle, what you have to do is to cut off the flow of information telling that muscle to continue to fire. And the antagonist muscles are largely what's responsible for that act. The synergists, one of the things that's important about knowing where the synergists are is it'll give you clues about the dysfunction, right? If you, the one I like to look at the most, by the way, is QL, quadratus lumborum. Uh, if, if I'm seeing somebody who has a, a, a major problem with over-recruited over -recruited QL, that gives me a clue that we're looking at possibly psoas dysfunction as well. And you can see that, well, that's a little bit faded now, but you can see that um, some of the other synergists are hip flexors, of course, and internal rotators, because even though psoas doesn't have uh, a very, doesn't have a, a, a moment arm as an internal rotator, a lot of its synergists do. So if you see uh, a ton of internal rotation, it's another clue that we're looking at possible psoas dysfunction. So, uh, the, the dysfunction then could be coming from the environment in which the muscle is operating rather than the actual fibers itself. A lack of antagonists, an overabundance of synergists uh, means that there's information always flowing in. Keep firing, keep firing, keep firing, and no amount of stretching is going to be able to release that. You've got to fix the sequence. You've got to put it back in order. Now, uh, let's jump ahead to the next part. Because the other thing about function is, is figuring out, you know, when it acts on its origins insertions, oh, we got a flash quiz. <laughs> so now is the time to take what we've talked about so far and see if you can answer a quick question uh, and um, maybe win some, some cool education. All right. So we have our first flash quiz. The way that it works is I'm going to read the question. The first person who types in their answer correctly, there is a question area where you can type in your answer, will win a free course from Leaders in Fitness. The value ranges from $50 to $75. So get ready. Again, it's the first person who types in the answer correctly. An overactive psoas major has the potential to cause large anterior shear forces to which verte vertebrae? L4, L5, L5, S1, S1, S2, or none of these. Again, whoever answers correctly. Oh, HR. Good job, HR. You are correct. Again, HR is correct. We are moving forward. Here we go. All right, so we're back to function, so as function. And uh, when it's acting on its origins and insertions, what is it doing? And this seems, may seem like a very straightforward question. And as you guys look at this uh, little infographic right here, hip flexor is the thing that we almost always talk about, right? In, in its, in its uh, demonized form, we talk about how, man, those tight hip flexors, that tight psoas is a hip flexor, hip flexor, hip flexor. And so we try to stretch it in hip extension. But what I'm going to posit here today, what I'm going to hope to demonstrate for you through a few studies here, uh, is that its function as a lumbar stabilizer, a lateral lumbar stabilizer, um, uh, is really quite important. And I think the source of most of its over-recruitment. Because, of course, if it's stuck working really, really hard stabilizing the lumbar spine, its uh, distal fibers that are trying to extend or even flex aren't going to be terribly effective. So uh, to, to support that claim, let's jump ahead here. I've got uh, a couple studies I want to share with you. This first one is a, a Japanese study from the Journal of Orthopedic Science done in 2002. Um, and, and they used uh, 25 cadavers to measure psoas activity. And they took uh, seven different angles of hip flexion. And then they measured the pressure along the long axis of the psoas major at eight different sites, and, and including the femoral head. So what they found is that these first zero to 15 degrees, an erector of the lumbar vertebral column, as well as a stabilizer of the femoral head, and so far, no mention of hip flexion. We move up 15 to 45 degrees. Less is a stabilizer of the femoral head, but still working as an erector. And it's not until we get to a full 45 to 60 degrees of flexion that it becomes an effective flexor of the lower extremity. And to me, this says a lot. <laughs> this says a lot. Uh, if we spend too much time just thinking about its hip flexor capacity, we don't think about what happens all the way from zero to 45 degrees. And between that zero to 45 degree mark of hip flexion, there's a lot of other things going on in hip stability, in uh, lumbosacral stability, 
um, which could be affecting the recruitment of the SOAS. So if we move ahead again, uh, we're looking at a, a, the activated straight leg raise. And this is a, a study out of the European Spine Journal from 2010, and I'm demonstrating the active straight leg raise for you here, where they were asking the question, is the uh, SOAS a, a substantial hip flexor in the ASLR? And what they found that was interesting, I mean, obviously there was a lot of recruitment throughout, and they have a lot of data about that. But the thing that really surprised me or interested me was that the ipsilateral psoas wasn't really the only thing firing. The contralateral psoas was firing. And not only was it firing, it was firing with the exact same amplitude and onset time. So what they concluded from this was that, that psoas had a function, the ipsilateral and contralateral acting bilaterally, uh, that wasn't necessarily all about the hip flexion. And, of course, <laughs> the lumbar stability is the only thing left that they can do. Um, so then if we look, we jump ahead again. I've got, I, I love this study. Uh, this one was, was a, a cool find, in my opinion. And we'll talk about that right after you get a chance to do your next flash quiz. Let's see what else we can learn. All right. So again, the way that the flash quizzes work is the first person to type in the question or the correct answer wins again another education course from Leaders in Fitness. So get those keyboards ready. Here we go. So we have the psoas major is myofascially connected to all of the following structures except the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, the external obliques, or the transverse abdominals. Which of the following structures is the psoas not myofascially connected to? Again, we're typing in the answers. Whoever types it in first will win the education. Good. So we have Chris Fusco. Answer the correct answer. Hey, good job, Chris. All right. So, and HR, good job again. But we have only one person who can win. So here we go, continuing. Thank you. Uh, so this is from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, it's a longstanding journal. And the study I dug up was all the way back from 1966. And one of the reasons I, I was it was time to use a study this old was, first of all, it's one of the first instances of direct electromyography being used uh, in the report in a journal. Uh, and it was specifically about the function of the psoas. Um, and, uh, and secondly, to point out that the, the, the findings of this study <laughs> have been around since 1966. And it's, it's interesting to me that for, this, for these things to be true and still in the, especially in the fitness environment, to still be obsessed with the, with the hip flexion function. But check this out. It, it, it it's a, a states that it does op operate in hip flexion, but that in sitting and standing, uh, it's vigorously active. I love that term. Vigorously active in controlling deviations of the trunk from the rest position. And then, more importantly, I thought, uh, is that as it's acting on these deviations from the rest position, it has to work a ton harder while you're sitting than while you're standing. Now, if you listened to my glute function talk, you remember, my, remember that I made kind of a big deal about sitting. Uh, I, I think it's one of the, the modern bane of human posture is, is the amount of time we spend sitting. And I referenced a study then in that, uh, in that talk about, uh, it was from the Australian Diabetes Institute, that Americans, at least, spend between 8 and 15 hours a day sitting. Uh, so let's take a, you know, a, a scenario, a hypothetical scenario, where you've got a person who's sitting for eight hours a day, which is putting them in an environment where their psoas is much more active, controlling deviations from their rest position. And let's say they don't have the greatest posture in the world. Now, I'm going to demonstrate for you here three forms of kind of crappy posture, and we'll take a look at what you think psoas is doing, right? So I've, I've highlighted here with the yellow line uh, the angle at my thoracolumbar junction, right? So we're taking a look kind of at where, where psoas or originates. I have a little bit of extension there. My QL on the right side is active. The red dot is a low hip. The blue dot is a high hip, which means that my pelvis is not sitting level. And so my psoas is having to work constantly to try to bring my spine back to a rest position. Now take a look at the next one. It's similar, but again, you tell me if you've seen this before. Concept is the same. I've got a tucked underlying, I've got a low hip, I've got a high hip. I've got one side QL, 
overactive. This means I've got one side psoas overactive, right? I've got this imbalance of lumbar stability. So rather than the quick bursts of contraction the psoas is designed to do to pull your spine back to rest, I've got one long agonizing pull that happens for the entire time that I'm sitting. Now, to look at the next one, matter of fact, a few of you might be doing this next one right now. So, uh, this posture has a little bit different thing going on. Uh, I'm having a little delay on my slide. Are we showing that slide? Yes. Emily? Ah, oh, there we go. A uh, little bit different thing going on. So, first of all, if I have the tendency to have one side, one of my sides more uh, dysfunctional than the other, if I have one tight hip flexor side and one less tight hip flexor side, doesn't matter how level I feel, I'm most likely tilting to some degree. But the other thing about this one is that I'm in a totally uncontrolled, this is a unecentrically controlled lumbar flexion, and I'm in an unecentrically controlled hip flexion. So this means that my psoas is currently cranking down against my thoracolumbar junction bilaterally and not being able to get any traction because all of my extensor, my hip extensors, aren't acting eccentrically. Right, so that little red dot is there to kind of kind of point out that's where all of the off is happening. Nothing is going on there that needs to be going on. Now, sitting this way, of course, can be damaging and, and, and pressuring, but the real issue comes when you try to stand up. Because when I go from my flex position to my extended position, and I've got the high origins of my psoas cranking down against you know uh, 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 T12 and L1, um, there's no way that's going to let go if I'm not giving it proper eccentric, uh, or at this point now concentric, uh, uh, signals to do so. So I'm going to stand up and my hip's not going to extend all the way. Instead, my lumbar spine is going to extend in an effort to get me to stand up. And if you do this frequently enough, you don't even notice it. But you never really reach full hip extension. And it's not directly because of your uh, um, psoas. It's because of the environment in which the psoas has to maintain its contraction. So. This is the major point that I'm trying to get at. Instead of looking purely at what our hips are doing, we need to look at the geometry of the lumbar spine to the pelvis. Let's jump ahead to the next slide. So like I said, you know, the, the method that I started with is Pilates. I also use a lot of Chinese martial arts like Chai Chi, Qigong, Kung Fu, whatever, to help people uh, feel some of these principles. But whatever method you have, Here's a set of priorities that I want, to, I want to kind of present to you as a way to go forward. If you're seeing somebody who's got uh, a bound psoas, first and foremost, we've got to get the eccentric hip extensors back into play. Now, uh, I have a lot of exercises I like to use to do that, but I'm sure you do too. The goal, I think, is to first of all try to identify the hip extensors really clearly. So we're looking mostly at glute max. Uh, but then also another really good one is adductor magnus. Uh, the posterior fibers of adductor magnus operate as a, as a direct antagonist to psoas um, and also are one of the muscles that allow you to go into, act, you know, into full hip extension. One of the things I found when trying to engage hip extensors is that um, the transverse plane is really useful for this. If you try to do hip extensors bilaterally, like in the uh, um, uh, sagittal plane, it can be very easy to accidentally get into lumbar extension, especially if you've already got somebody with tight hips. Because you know, just letting go is so non-habitual, you know, they're not going to know exactly what you need to do. But the transverse plane allows you to go along with the lateral fibers of the extensors. You can deal with them individually, and that can be much more effective, I've found. Um, uh, the thing I want to mention about the adductor magnus, in Pilates, one of the terms I really dislike <laughs> is um, when, when someone goes into lateral rotation, we call that wrapping. Wrap your thigh bones into lateral rotation. I think that sends the wrong image. It's not really a wrap, right? Adductor magnus is contracting in a straight line. And that, and that line is going from flexion to extension at kind of a V angle, right? Going from a wider leg to an adducted leg. So if you've got somebody you're trying to get into lateral rotation, maybe experiment, instead of telling them to wrap the thigh outward, simply to engage, almost in an adducted direction. And for the client, it'll actually feel a lot like a hamstring. That's the funny thing about adductor magnus. If you ask them what they're feeling, they'll tell you they're feeling their hamstrings. It, 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 um, it doesn't feel like an adductor. It's an interesting muscle in that way. 
So um, the second priority, reestablish the spine's rest position. This is really the crux. Uh, if you've got somebody who's got one side deviated, uh, or, or one side psoas, which is always gripping, the pelvis, particular in a sitting position, is never going to be perpendicular to the spine. So after you've engaged those hip extensors, you have to try to get that, you know, the, the um, ASIS and the PSIS to be level to each other, such that the psoas can be, as you found in that last study, electrically silent. And when you have an electrically silent psoas, you'll have much easier hip extension. The other thing that I found interesting is that uh, since it almost always is one side or the other, uh, doing exercises or movements uh, the same amount on both sides, I don't think is necessary. You know, for instance, uh, in my own body, right, I know that my right glute is the one that's a little bit more inhibited. So if I'm doing an exercise that's meant to switch on the glutes unilaterally, I'm going to spend a lot more time on my right one than my left. Um, the, you know, the, the whole concept here is that the right glute is inhibited, meaning that it's inhibited whether or not it's extending or flexing, whether or not my leg is laterally rotated, internally rotated. So rather than doing the same movement on my left leg, I'm going to consider my right glutes no matter what my right leg is doing. So, you know, symmetrical exercise doesn't, doesn't really factor in. You, you just have to think of the relationship between the inhibited antagonist and the tight uh, agonist. And then lastly, for the third one, reinforce new internal relationships. Uh, this one's pretty simple, and this is where I really want to, I want you to think about your method. I want you to think about how you ask people to move because the, the, the patients or the clients that we're working with, if they have dysfunctional uh, hip flexors, you know, or dysfunctional back extensors or dysfunctional whatever, uh, they don't necessarily have a feeling of what the right way to move would be. You know, I see this all the time. If I, if I give someone a simple cue like flatten your back, stand up straight, uh, round your back, round your low back, they'll make all kinds of movements that fit in with their comfortable dysfunction. Uh, but it may not be the one that I asked for, right? So we have to try to give our clients uh, an idea of what the right kind of moving feels like, right? So if you've done priority one and you've woken up the hip extensors and you've done priority two and you've uh, uh, found a way to get them into a rest, spinal to rest position, then you have to design a huge variety of motions, simple motions, things like walking upstairs, getting up from a chair, you know, uh, uh, rolling from your left side to your right side, simple leg raises, you know, whatever, be creative. But where the focus is not on the exercise, the focus is on the relationship of the muscles you're trying to access. Any, any set of movements at all could be used to do that. Um, so I, I do have a few exercises that I find to be very useful for this. And so uh, um, in the wake of this, um, talk, uh, there'll be a few videos that'll be uploaded uh, on, for the EBFA blog uh, that'll kind of show you what I, what I like to do. But again, I would encourage you to be creative, to look for the relationship between antagonists and agonists um, and do what you do to get that relationship in your client's mind. Lastly, the other thing I want to touch on is uh, uh, manual manipulation. If you're a massage therapist uh, or an osteopath or a chiropractor, um, I found that if the, if the dysfunction is, is state, uh, um, dramatic enough, sometimes manual manipulation is one of the only ways that you're going to be able to show the client what I was talking about before, what, what moving correctly might feel like, you know, what hip flexion without a gripping hip flexor would feel like. Um, and so uh, for those of you who are in kind of fitness or movement, who are Pilates or yoga people, I would encourage you to commit, you know, make a partnership with a massage therapist or an osteopath so that that between the two of you you can create release and design movement that create a new sense of how what proper moving really looks like so uh, I want you guys to have access to some of the studies that I use today so this just the last slide is a little bibliography so you can take a look at these um, uh, and, and pour through them yourselves. There's a lot of information. You know, so as function is not exactly a subtle topic. And so it's something that gets discussed a lot and researched a lot. And so there's a lot of information. Um, so I would encourage you to go out and, and, and look for yourself. But uh, let's see if we can't take all that information and win something else on another flash quiz.
All right, so we have our last flash quiz. This one is a little bit more of a fill in the blank. So it's not multiple choice. So again, get your typewriters, your keypads ready. Last quiz, you're going to type it in where we say the questions, okay? So again, what is Cox's Sultans, and how does this diagnosis relate to tonight's webinar? So again, just type it in where the questions are. First person to answer it correctly will win a free course from Leaders in Fitness. What is Cox's Sultans? If you are Googling it, I hope you type fast. <laughs> Just in case. So I guess you could Googling. say no, no, no Googling, <laughs> but uh, can't really enforce that, can you? Right, right, exactly. Since we're we're on the internet right now, so again, Cox Sultans, how does this diagnosis relate to tonight's webinar? As far as Cox Sultans, you probably have some clients who have this and who have asked you, "What is this? What is this diagnosis or why why am I experiencing this? It's related to the psoas and now you can answer it. So we'll give another few seconds. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair, Kevin. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right, so Luke Nelson, good job. Chris, you got it right too, but you already won a prize, so congratulations again. So Luke Nelson got it correct. What Cox Assault Put you on off, Chris. <laughs> what uh, Cox Assaultans is, is it's your snapping hip syndrome, or it's called a dancer's hip. It's usually when your clients are dropping their hip into extension that they'll feel like their hip is popping. It's something that's kind of in the groin. And what it is, it can be the psoas tendon popping over either the AIIIS or AIIS or um, the groove in the pelvis bone. So that could be their psoas popping over the, the pelvis bone. That would be coxa sultans. It can also be the TFL or IT band that's popping. So congratulations to Luke. If you guys have any questions for Kevin. Actually, do you mind if I, do you mind if I just add a quick piece of information about that real quick? Sure, of course. Because I because I, I had just kind of ended talking about uh, trying to introduce manual manipulation. Sure, of course. Um, uh, I found that on um, people for whom uh, it's really difficult to get them out of that popping, there there are two things that have always been really helpful. One, uh, trying to take the femur into a, a little bit of lateral rotation, mm -hmm. and in addition to that, applying some kind of manual releasing pressure to the internal border of the TFL kind of right right under the iliac crest like if i can support the leg uh, apply pressure to that the inner border of the tfl uh, and then laterally rotate the femur uh, that again gives them a sense of what it's like to move that leg up and down without the popping the other thing that i find really interesting is that if you laterally rotate the femur uh, if it's if it's a pronounced popping if you laterally rotate the femur the other thing that helps is to try to get them to internally rotate uh, the tibia, right? Get the lower leg to try to internally rotate, get even the foot to kind of fall in toward the pinky side, while the pinky toe side, while they externally rotate their femur. That little um, competing spiral uh, in, in the lower leg can also create a kind of a fascial release that goes all the way up to the hip. Anyway, oh. I've, I've had a lot of success with that technique. Excellent. Thank you so much for that addition, Kevin. Um, so if anyone has any questions for Kevin on the SOAS, the webinar, um, you can type them in into the questions box and we will answer a couple of those questions. And then Kevin, um, if you want to say your email so people could email you if they have any additional questions. Mm, sure, of course. Um, so my email is uh, kmore, K-M-O-O-R-E, just like my name, at smarterstrength.com. Okay, so again, any questions? Um, and we will be following up with some of the exercises that Kevin had um, described or had recommended for creating a SOAS balance. And those will be posted this following week on the EBFA blog. So um, there are no questions. Um, no questions, really? I, I have a question, actually. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. So when somebody is sitting and their leg is crossed, right? So they have mm -hmm. um, 
say their left ankle over their right knee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then in that picture, that was your first one. And you said that mm -hmm. the QL would be overactive on the right side? Uh, if the left leg is crossed, most likely yes. Okay, so that means that their, their right psoas is overactive as well. It's getting a misfiring because of the QL? Uh, to say because of the QL, it and the QL are both misfiring, but the, the, okay. the, the primary kind of impetus for that would be the imbalance in the hip. Because if, you, if you've got one leg crossed, it means that your, your weight, because one leg is higher than the other, you're probably going to be shifted toward the higher leg so that the, the issue tuberosity of the leg that is crossed is going to be sitting heavier or lower or deeper. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is it puts that hip into more flexion, but it also puts it relatively lower than the other. So really, it's it's not good for either. So, <laughs> oh, know, okay. but both of them both of them are going to be recruited poorly um, in 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 that scenario. Okay, Does great. That make sense? Yep, absolutely. And uh, we do have a question from Juan. Um, can the psoas be stressed due to a wrong position on the bike? Many people ride putting, absolutely. Many people ride putting more weight on one side than the other. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I would even argue that um, like hard competitive riding is one of the more vulnerable exercises uh, for the psoas. That, it, that if someone has a tendency toward um, a, a tight hip flexor, riding can be a dangerous exercise for them. Um, uh, you spend all your time in hip flexion, you spend almost all your time in internal rotation, and just like you said, if you have if you have any kind of imbalance or a side you prefer to weight, weighting down in that side over that environment and doing that many strokes, that much power is going to reinforce that bad behavior really, really heavily. So, so th that would be a, a, a person who is a perfect example of somebody who probably doesn't know what, move, what sitting or moving correctly would even feel like. And so you have to try to get them, uh, I would say that's a perfect candidate for manual release, some kind of manual release to help them feel like help them feel what it would be like to actually put weight on their non-dominant side and to use that non-dominant side as much as their dominant side. Um, but yeah, but if, if you've got somebody with an advanced psoas dysfunction, uh, get, get them off the bike, <laughs> you know? Okay, great. So um, we have another question. Um, how is psoas function affected by structural scoliosis? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, well, structural scoliosis typically causes some kind of rotation in the pelvis. And so when we're talking about um, you know, creating spinal rest, um, spinal rest can't really happen in the presence of, of, of pelvic rotation. So in particular, in a sitting environment, um, uh, it doesn't have to be just a kind of a coronal shift of the pelvis, one side simply lower than the other. If you've got one ilium rotating forward, you are probably putting the rotated forward side into lumbar extension, which again is that you get that QL cue, right? Uh, and that side is then going to be shorter in the psoas. Uh, you'll see it in the sitting position, but even with a scoliosis patient, um, standing as well is also going to have kind of constant recruitment of one side, always, always dragging one lumbar spine down. And this is where I was talking before, uh, to, to re-engage uh, hip extensors, the priority one, right? Uh, taking that client into uh, standing position. Matter of fact, there, there's already a video of this on the EBFA blog from my glute uh, talk. Uh, taking them into a standing position and getting them in the transverse plane to activate the glute on the same side as their overactive QL. If that makes sense. Um, w will help them to create more spinal rest. Now, because of the scoliosis, they're probably always going to be drawn back out of spinal rest, but you can use kind of frequent eccentric kind of jolts to m mitigate the problem. But yeah, scoliosis is a, is a, is a major source of psoas dysfunction. All right. So um, I think that should be another webinar that you could do. <laughs> could be uh, one yeah. on scoliosis. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Um, uh, let's so she, the last question is, I have a client who's having continued pain at her ischial tuberosity 
with hip extension, single leg deadlift, single leg squats. She has a lot of lateral instability, probably sacral instability. Um, and it's mainly hip extension that bothers her. To me, that sounds like a hamstring insertion, like a probably. Problem. But but I'll tell you another thing that uh, that that makes you want to touch on a little bit. Uh, glute medius, though it isn't necessarily a uh, an antagonist properly um, of psoas anyway. Um, opposite side glute med. Again, let, let's let's take a hypothetical person who has uh, whose right psoas is the is the more largely over recruited one. Um, glute med on the opposite side is one of the things that we can use to start taking energy out of the hip flexors of that uh, over recruited side. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I wish I had a picture of this now. Um, if you think of the of the position of the glute med versus the position of the iliacus. Uh, it, it, the, the glute med helps to, in some ways, antagonize, though not directly, the function of the iliacus on the other side. So if you've got somebody who's, who's experiencing pain at the issue tuberosity, and she's talking about a single leg deadlift, my guess is she's not getting any eccentric control from her glute medius, and the hamstring is trying to do it. Um, uh, and so trying to, to load glute medius of the opposite side eccentrically, this is to say to kind of push the hip a, a, away from the painful side as though pushing against a wall so that rather than getting a lot of shifting, a lot of coronal shifting, what you get is the feeling of resistance coming from the glute med on the opposite side uh, can help to make the same side, the, the over-recruited side, feel safer, right? So you're not, you're not compressing the pelvis against the standing leg. You're pulling it away from the standing leg to create kind of more space in the... Um, Hip socket. So that's another thing to look for. Glute, glute medius as not a direct antagonist, but as kind of an indirect method of taking pressure off of the over recruited leg. Excellent. Great, great, great question. Um, let's see. So cycling would not strengthen the psoas, is an, a continuation of Juan's question. Um, no. I mean, Technically, any movement, uh, you know, the, the, how do I say, the psoas can be recruited functionally in any movement. But if you've got someone who's already, um, who already biases toward dysfunctional movement, it is highly unlikely you're going to get them to change that behavior on a bike. And it's much more likely they're going to exacerbate, ex exacerbate that behavior on a bike. Um, uh, I guess the one exception to that, but again, I would never use this with a client, but just to kind of play the devil's advocate, um, you can get pretty strong firing of your kind of glute max during during a during riding, um, but it's it would be hard to find through all of the other things going on. So, for instance, at, with with my Pilates uh, uh, exercises. There are a few very controlled motions I could put someone in that would simulate riding a bike, wherein I could cue proper activation of glute max, right? You know, to cue the opening and closing of the issue tuberosities, to cue the um, mild lateral rotation of the hip. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of ways I could cue that in a controlled environment. But just to put him outside on a bike with somebody who doesn't really know what moving correctly might feel like, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to go well. <laughs> okay thank you so much for answering the questions kevin um thank you guys for tuning in again i really appreciate you supporting ebfa and um, all of the education that we put out and of course our webinars first thursday of every month um, if you do want to listen to any of the past uh ebfa webinars they are kept on our YouTube page, which is youtube.com backslash ebfa fitness thank you again kevin Oh, it's my pleasure. I really enjoyed it, as usual. Great. So you guys will be seeing Kevin again. So um, he had a great uh, webinar that he did on the glutes, and that is on our archive. So I encourage you guys to tune in and listen to that. And then otherwise, I will see you guys in March for another great webinar. And again, they are all sponsored, so you can win some more free education. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, Emily, for putting this on. You're very welcome. Take care.